My name is Zeeshan Lakani. I work at Basho on Distributed Systems and React specifically. <coughs> I'm also a founder and organizer of Papers We Love. Uh, and this title is the, the Meaning of LFE. It looks like the Meaning of Life if you look at it quickly. And uh, the title actually comes from Michael Fogus. Uh, we were talking about uh, Liz Slavert Erlang, and, and he, he had this idea, so uh, I'm stealing from him, and he's a good person to steal from. Okay, so you know it's a good talk. Uh, we have Nicolas Cage uh, here, so you know it's, this is going to be awesome. Um, so this is an uh, adaptation, uh, and the reason why I have this in here is because uh, um, I'm not sweating as much, but uh, the movie adaptation is like a movie about a, a writer who writes himself into the film, and there's a twin, and this whole thing that happens as well. But they're writing yourself into the film. So as I was preparing this talk, and it's only 30 minutes, and I decided to actually make it shorter, um, you know, there could, I could go really into why Erlang, why Lisp, why everything together, and there'll be a little parts of that here. But um, it's, too, it's too much to cover uh, of all these languages. So I said, let me write myself in into the parts I found kind of really interesting as I learned, uh, as I was learning LFE. Um, yeah, so um, I write Erlang every day at Basho. I did not know Erlang before I went there. I still consider myself a, a kind of a, a, you know, a someone who's still pretty new to Erlang. Uh, there's still new, thing, new things that I get from it all the time. So um, uh, as I kind of went through this talk, I really got a sense a lot of the history uh, that is around, and one important person, not maybe as important as Joe Armstrong in the history of it, but Robert Verding is very, very important. Uh, so he joined the Erlang team in 1988. Um, at that time, they were trying to do more of an interpreted Erlang. Uh, and then in 2008, he created Lisp flavored Erlang, and I'll show uh, a little bit uh, when I have my LFE slide why he did, and I think they're really interesting reasons. But let's talk about Erlang. Who, who here maybe has played with Erlang, written Erlang? Cool, that's actually. Nice. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, so 1986, um, kind of the initial, you know, there was initial work done in the 85 uh, range, but 86 was the first kind of release of it. Uh, we don't get like OTP, uh, which we know, uh, you know, is like where we have all this kind of great sugar for all the stuff that Erlang gives us. Uh, that doesn't come out to 96. Erlang's open sourced in 98. Um, but there was a lot of early years. There was uh, the like initial version where they, uh, one of the initial versions where they had Erlang running on Prolog, uh, which uh, was a uh, jam. Joe Armstrong, uh, yeah, Joe's abstract machine, which is a uh, pretty great. So there's a great, there's actually an amazing paper on the history of Erlang uh, written by Joe Armstrong, um, uh, which I highly recommend if you want to get an idea of all the the things they tried and why there's uh, some similarities to Prolog in the syntax and things. Um, why there's also a lot of benefits when they went to C. Um, yeah, so the idea of concurrency-oriented programming language, this comes from uh, Joe Armstrong's uh, dissertation, which was only finished, actually, uh, I think in the, in the like, early 2000s. So he kind of went back, to, I guess, to finish it, or maybe he was waiting there for years. Uh, but these things are really good. I think these are the, the kind of fundamental tenets of why Erlang is so great. Um, if you, th every, you know, everything is with a process. Several processes operating on the same machine must be isolated. A fault in one process should not affect another. This is why, I mean, obviously, we, we, I work on a database. Erlang is very good for all these for all these tenants. Each process must have a you know we have PIDs with PIDs we can do a lot of things. Uh, we do a lot of tracing. Uh, we can feed P, uh, PIDs and get like an eFlame graph uh, of everything going on in our system. Um, there should be no shared state, uh, so everything is on a process. When I talk about uh, some garbage collection stuff, you'll see also why that uh, that uh, no shared state is really really important. Um, you know, everything is done through message passing. This is what we know as the actor model, uh, which when they were creating Erlang, they did not call it the actor model. It just kind of happened. This is how it worked best for them when they were creating it at Ericsson Labs. Um, and yes, yeah, so those last ten, it should be possible for one process to detect a failure in another process. Um, we should know how, and we should know the reason for this failure. I'll talk more about that. So some important tenets too, like uh, uh, John Armstrong talked about in the programming Erlang book, so really early, that, you know, Erlang was created with the sense of, of writing for concurrency and distributed systems, whether that was on one core, on one machine, and later as things became truly distributed, now we have all this hardware. So in uh, 2005, 2006, they even had uh, SMP support, which now allowed that you can have all these schedulers on many threads. So um, even though there was obviously work to make this happen, as, as the hardware improves and we have more ability, Erlang has really um, went forth to, to, to uh, adapt to those things and, and give us a system that, you know, maybe not as performant as some things like in C++, it's still very performant for the needs that we have in this kind of soft, real-time way. Uh, so as I talked about things that people might know, 
uh, you know, idea of a mailbox, one per process, messages sent and receive. We're not sharing any state. We pass messages around, we pass data around, and that's how we can deal with, with things. There is, there is some mutable idea of state when you think of like process, uh, process dictionary and ETS. It's so a whole talk, we can talk about each of those things specifically. But in general, people know Erlang as passing messages around. That's how you can do things like side effects. But on a per process level, everything is single assignment. It's pure, um, minus again these things of uh, ETS and process dictionaries we're going to talk about. Um, but here's just an example of some code where uh, I'm not using any like, of the OTP sugar here, just using a spawn here, but I have a process flag where I can capture, capture the, an exit. So if a process, this process uh, that I'm actually calling, this uh, sync process later, if it, has, if it crashes, I can actually catch that and do something. This is the part, the, the tenants that was in the COPPL uh, slide, where I actually know about when other processes, another process fails. And I can do things based on that. So, you know, one of the things when I was learning Erlang that really, really, you know, jumped out for me was this ability, well then, uh, and OTB obviously makes it much easier, where I could have these different kinds of supervisors. So, um, you know, the one for one, this process fails, it gets restarted. And people say all the time, Erlang, let it crash, that's kind of the whole thing. Uh, it, to me, it's, yeah, let it crash is a big thing, but also um, having so much knowledge about why. There's so much you can do to figure out why these things are happening and then to trap these things and deal, and deal, and deal with it. Uh, and the supervisors are really great for that because these are really the different restart strategies. So, uh, for example, we have the one for all. So maybe if all those processes, uh, all those processes are, are kind of linked together, if one fails, we can fit, we can, uh, if one has, you know, crashes, we can crash them all and then they'll all restart. Uh, and the thing for the rest for one. Um, so this ability to, to have processes watch processes and determine how they're linked in that structure gives you a lot of power to understand your system. Uh, one of the earliest slides I had in the bottom, uh, which is a, from a talk that I, uh, one of the recent Erlang factories or EUCs, where he says it's, it's not about, you know, uh, Erlang, you know, the let it crash thing, we talk about that, but it's about resiliency to bugs. You might have bugs in your system. You can write a lot of probably most production or healing systems have bugs in the system. But it's the resiliency to know that maybe there are points when those bugs won't happen all the time. Uh, that, and if they do happen, it does crash the system, we know that we have, we have ways around it. That's really important. And from a production kind of standpoint of larger systems, Sometimes all you need is just to keep, keep running. And obviously there's other things like Erlang has like hot co-loading, which was probably more used uh, at a different time. But we you know, to have this process that no matter what's happening in the system, we have ways to uh, keep going. All right, so now we're moving to list plan. Um, so where Erlang has, you know, there's obviously the background there in Prolog and, and, and other kinds of concepts from, from functional programming. Uh, Lisp uh, has, uh, you know, has a lot of other power. I mean, it's a great talk by David Nolan that he gave in New York that I always like, which is called Lisp is Too Powerful. Uh, and he was talking about it more in the sense, too, how like things in ClojureScript have happened where, you know, JavaScript programmers are not ready to, to handle the power that, that you have in Lisp. Um, and I think uh, this Paul Graham quote, I mean, obviously John McCarthy is the, you know, the foundation behind, this, behind Lisp, but the, this Graham quote, where he says, the whole language is always available uh, which to me is an amazing thing. And actually, as I was playing with LFE again, I, I, you know, I, I, with Erlang, you have like a shell. But with LFE, uh, you're, you're, I'm a, I was back at a rep. I had done a lot of closure code previously in my previous job. And I forgot how fun it was. Lisp is really fun. It's super powerful. Yeah, um, it, you know, Haskell won't let you do certain things, and that's why they have a really great type system. In Lisp, you can really do anything you want, and I think there is, there is kind of an amazement, uh, amazing thing there. Uh, I also mentioned, like, obviously, so when you, when you see some of the LFE stuff, there's a lot of stuff from Common Lisp, but there's a lot of stuff from Scheme as well. Um, and I love Scheme. It's on the, the Lambda paper here. I also am a huge Racket fan. I wish uh, it was a little bit more performant. I would just use it every day. Um, okay, so uh, here are a couple examples from The Little Schemer. I think it's the, uh, one of my favorite books. Um, you know, what is an X expression? Now, so we're talking about Lisp. These are uh, S expressions. Um, and that's what everything is. I mean, the beauty of Lisp is that it's, it's in some ways, it's in, in many ways, it's really small. Uh, I, you print, I mean, obviously, there's always other functions that people add and macros and like, in languages like Clojure, there's a lot of stuff added to core uh, in the standard library. But at, at itself, the way to process lists and do things with lists, you can do almost everything. Uh, but there are monads. Uh, I won't get into it too much. And there are a couple of great examples of actually like monads in Erlang and how you can bring those to, to list flavored Erlang. But uh, there's a great paper about kind of uh, monads in a, in a, in a more uh, Lisp uh, point of view uh, by Adam Fulter and uh, Daniel Freeman Fulter, who gave the crypto workshop here. Okay. 
Uh, so there's this uh, quote by Andrew Appel that says, uh, uh, the, uh, it's in one of the, uh, the compiler implementation books, where the notion of the abstract syntax is due to McCarthy, who designed it. The abstract syntax was intended to be used by writing programs until designers could get, around, uh, could get around to create a concrete syntax with human readable punctuation instead of lots of ir irritating uh, silly parentheses. Um, <laughs> So I don't know how true this is. It, you know, it's definitely in his book. Uh, maybe it's a joke. Maybe it's real. Um, that the, you know, they were going to have a more uh, true compiled system at some point. Um, but it just took off. And maybe I think it took off because of some of the reasons we'll see. And, and a lot of it, used, you know, Rich Hickey, uh, the last talk referenced in one of his talks. But that idea of code is data. I can take code. I can output it. I have data. I can then eval that back as code. And we'll see some examples of that. That you know, homogeneity is the term for that. Um, it gets, I think, used in a lot of, a lo a lot of things. But there's an ability that, uh, in, especially in the runtime, I can um, interpret what I'm doing. And no matter what it is, whether it's the output of a function or passed around to various things, it's all the same thing. The data structures are the code. Um, so here are some of the reasons, I won't, list, I won't go through them all, why Robert Verndon uh, decided to create Lisp flavored Erlang. Obviously he had been working on Erlang, he obviously is on a lot of the early papers, he's on the garbage collection, the, the, the kind of initial garbage collection paper as well, uh, wor worked on a lot of the initial tooling of Erlang. Um, but he was an old Lisper, as he talks about. Um, if, and you, as you read through these reasons here, he wanted to experiment with compiling another language on top of Erlang. Um, he was not working with Erlang at the time, so he's looking for some other interesting project. He likes languages. I mean, nothing in here, uh, the fun problem solved, nothing in here is like, you should use this because it will make your app better or it will make your system better. None of those reasons. There's reasons why people use Erlang for that. There's reasons why you have Lisp. But at the end of the day, it was something to do for fun because these are languages. We forget now. We, we, we have so much uh, discussion about which language is better for this. They're all really good for various things. I use a lot of different languages for all kinds of software that I've written. But it's sometimes about being fun and creating a language. And that's what I'll be talking about going forward. So now we're moving away. So this is like a, a very Erlangy example in Lisp flavored Erlang. Uh, Basically, I'm sending messages here, spawning a PID. And I'm sending these messages. I, and the, the output there on the bottom where I send the message, that's me just doing it on the shell. Uh, and I, I'll call it actually the REPL from now on. Because in list favorite Erlang, uh, the REPL, uh, unlike the Erlang shell, you can actually define functions. You can actually uh, define macros. You can slurp in macros from various files uh, and, and play with things there. So that's actually something very different uh, from the, my everyday working on the Erlang shell. Was, I was like really uh, happy, again, to have a real REPL where I can define functions <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and interact. Um, so in this here, I'm, on, I'm in the REPL. I send a message to it. I send a couple other messages. And then I flush, which means then I get the receiving, the receive block, that synchronous block back. So I get these messages. This is you know, a pretty typical kind of Erlang receive block. But here I am in, in now Erlang, uh, in uh, list favorite Erlang. Um, Nothing too crazy here, but we'll get into, I think, more interesting things. Uh, but I guess one thing I will mention is the let. So here I can define the, the local scope this way, uh, which uh, coming from obviously closure and, and, and scheme, um, I was very happy for. Now, uh, you know, uh, Erlang has pattern matching. For me, uh, I think it's really great. I had done some SML where we're doing pattern matching on types uh, and, and various things. But in Erlang, the kind of the, hot, the hotness is that you can pattern match on binary. Uh, we do this in some, obviously in a lot of stuff in React, but there are people using it for all kinds of reasons. This is a really simple example of doing a list favorite airline, but you get this. You get binary pattern matching. Um, so you match on the bits. It's really, really great. Uh, and the pattern matching in general has made it so easy. I mean, of all the languages I've learned, uh, whether I was doing Python, Ruby, and the more functional languages, I will say, uh, maybe because I had obviously done some, some scheme in, in Clojure before, but Erlang has been the easiest program for, uh, programming language for me to learn. I think the, the concept of single assignment, uh, functions, uh, first class modules that you can just kind of call and do, do dispatch on, uh, polymorphic dispatch on, and, and, uh, and the ability to do all this pattern, you know, all the pattern matching that you, that you can from a functional uh, standpoint, not from types, uh, is, still, is really amazing. All right, so now we get into some more uh, um, uh, lispy things we come here. So this is really, I think this is really cool. This is a, a a do uh, call, which is not like a do from closure, but more like a, a do from, from Lisp, um, where I, I basically can bind, bind these variables, uh, n, m, and c here, to an to initial value that will then increase or apply that function that I have uh, to the right-hand side. 
And as it goes through the loop, it just basically does like a do until, constantly applying the body. Do until um, this, that n is greater than m, and then give me, the, give me the return value. So this is actually something that you will not really get to see in Erlang. This is when you start moving into like, now I'm doing these things uh, with, in, in, a, in a Lisp uh, kind of way. Uh, if you see here, I have this little print statement as a, a different function I had, where I'm actually passing a function, printing that out, and then the print function actually has evals that function. So again, this idea of code as data, data as code. OK, so here's another example of like side by side. Uh, this is considered uh, Joe Armstrong's favorite program, uh, just a snippet of it. It's like a factorial server. Uh, so you see the Erlang version uh, with the receive block there. And here we have the LFE block. I mean, these things don't look too crazy. Um, you know, you see like we have tuple. Uh, there's, no, um, there's, uh, you know, uh, there's no concept of like the uh, squiggly bracket in LFE, for example. So we use tuple. There is a shortcut you can do with types like tuple and binary. Like you saw with the binary, it's a hashtag, uh, 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 hashtag or, or pound b, pound, and then, uh, yeah. So that's just an example there. OK, so I was, I was kind of going through this. Uh, LFE is really interesting. I'm getting to know things. We're going to talk a little bit about how this uh, compiles to an immediate, uh, intermediate representation and then to the uh, VM beam. Um, so. Uh, but I was telling you going there, I was like, you know, garbage collection. This is the cool thing. So, so how does garbage collection work in Erlang? Because um, really, we're talking about the same thing. And we have other languages. I mean, I'll talk a li really briefly about uh, Elixir as well and how it does uh, something a little specific to macros, which is really interesting. Um, but um, there's a great paper I was reading. They, they've obviously probably changed the, the garbage collector uh, around time. Uh, uh, through time, but uh, the one, pa one pass real time generational Mark Sweep garbage collection paper by Vernon and Armstrong was really cool. And so it basically has this idea where it um, uh, talks about generational GC, um, where it, you know, the idea that the most objects only live a very short time while small, a small portion live longer. So it can collect, if you think of it like that, uh, like. Um, uh, we have this, hor this you know, horizontal thing where you have the, the, those that are younger and those that are older. It will collect the younger ones, and, but does it on a per process level. So we, that's why you know, one, one of the kind of really cool, awesome things in Erlang is that even though there might, maybe the garbage collector on one process is taking a long time, it doesn't affect the rest of the processes. Each process is its own stack and heap. Um, so, you know, the one caveat to that is things have gotten newer from the original Market Suite paper is that um, we, s we have that, s that single uh, heap on each process uh, for, for uh, objects that are only up to 64 bytes in size. Now, when binaries are greater than 64 bytes, uh, there is a separate heap for the, for, uh, for the uh, application that uh, is, uh, is reference counted. So it's a little different. There's some issues, you know, it, good and bads that occur with that depending on how, how, how large your objects are. Uh, there's a great, some, uh, great book, uh, Erlang and Anger, for more like production system stuff by Fred Herbert that uh, uh, goes into that more. But it's really interesting. So as I was kind of going through, I'm here. Yeah, go for it. So, so the, for, for binaries, there's one heap for the whole VM, right? Yeah. Yeah. For the, again, the, only the larger objects. Yeah, go on there. OK. So as I was, you know, I'm getting the GC. I'm getting to this. Again, this is my kind of path as I'm learning list flavored Erlang. So I, I kept going back and forth. And uh, so. The next step for me was, OK, now let's talk about interop. And I, f I think maybe in earlier versions of List Favorite Erlang, I heard maybe interop was a, was a little bit harder. Uh, there is definitely no problem now. And I'll show that in an example. But actually, uh, you can actually run. Uh, it's not 100% working from what I've read. I didn't try this myself. But you can actually uh, interop with Elixir as well. Uh, in List Favorite Erlang. So you, you know, all these things that are, that, are, that are being compiled on Beam can kind of uh, coexist, and you can use them together. Use libraries, use this. And it all works out really well. So um, yeah, so at, uh, at uh, React, we, run all, we, we, have, uh, uh, we pay even for a license for uh, Erlang QuickCheck from a company called Qvic, where John Hughes works. John Hughes, who created QuickCheck, the original paper, uh, and worked on a lot of the, uh, the like early, uh, early Haskell. And um, we use it all the time. And I was like, I was not sure. If I was going get, to get it to work, because I can't actually explore the quick check code because it's like under a license, uh, if I can actually get this to work uh, in list flavored Erlang. So I have these uh, HRL files, which are kind of, kind of like Erlang header files where we can put in, we can put in types for when we can use dialyzer. Uh, we can put in uh, any maybe macros we're going to use across uh, an application for all, all different modules. Um, so uh, when, you, when you load EQC and you have your license installed, uh, you just add these libs, and things are just supposed to work. 
And we see here, uh, you know, I, I can give, uh, you know, talks about property-based testing at a whole other time and quick check, but we have a simple, like, just checking the property of reversing a list here. But all this works, this, this list favorite Erlang with quick check. You see that I have the, the colon EQC, that's me calling into the interop there. There's a couple ways you can do interop. Uh, there's like the colon first, which is sometimes really nice from a naming convention, but you can, I could also just say EQC colon uh, quick check. But this works. I run this. Boom. You can even see I have some real tests. They pass. It's a real thing. Interop is really, really easy, even from doing quick check tests. <coughs> okay. um, so we talked about the REPL, how great it is, how I can define functions. I can define uh, variables in, in the process of, of the REPL. I can define macros. Uh, LFE is a uh, Lisp 2, so it's like common Lisp. Uh, Erlang has kind of a flat namespace because you can actually pass modules around and, and do, do things with it. Um, Lisp 2 um, you know, allows me, uh, it has a different namespace for variables and a different namespace for functions. So you see in this example here, um, I can set this variable xx for, I, I can have the function xx, I can call it 3, this is the matter. Obviously, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about hygienic macros when I get to the macro section. Here in closure, Lisp 1, for example, the, the, the vari that would fail here. Uh, calling the, uh, getting the variable, calling the function would fail because it, can't have, it doesn't understand that it's two different namespaces. Now, this is, this is protecting you. Again, in a, in a more common Lisp varied world, you can do whatever you want. Um, so I had done a lot of racket. I took a class. Uh, uh, and programming languages at Coursera by Dan Grossman, highly recommended, how I got into functional programming, really. Uh, and I said, oh, let me take some of my racket examples, and can I just convert them to list favorite Erlang? How, how hard or easy would that be? Uh, here's a, uh, this one is like, <laughs> it's, it's hard to tell the difference. Um, uh, I'm just defining here like a sequence with a, with a stride or a step that you, can, that you can do here. There's obviously a difference. I have null, I have an empty list. Uh, but this works pretty well. So coming from a scheme or racket land, LFE is like, wow, and I, you know, has all access to OTP, um, every, you know, any kind of Erlang program you want to run. And yet, you know, if you know scheme, you can just do it. It's pretty amazing. Something a little more interesting, uh, the concept of like having a cond. Um, we, can do w with, uh, we can do pattern matching too, which uh, I've shown in a couple previous slides and I'll show in a few more. But this is more like I can actually do these checks in a, in a cond fashion where it just basically, go, it basically tries each one until it goes to the bottom. Um, pretty simple stuff if you've done scheme, but to have this I think is really nice from, a, from an expression level. So here is something a little more interesting. I was like, oh, let me, uh, let me create a function. Um, I'll show just ahead what this looks like, uh, where I, I put in a list of 1, 2, 3, 4, and then A dash C, and it basically cycles through the list and creates these pairs. Um, that cycle list function, that's actually returning a function that I'm actually like a stream. And then in, the, in stream for n steps, I'm actually uh, executing the thunk lazily. So, I mean, Erlang, you know, uh, usually pr promotes eagerness, but uh, you have the ability to do laziness. Um, and he, I think here, from a, from a Lisp uh, kind of flavor, it's actually like almost easier to do and easier to understand. Um, so here I am, just consing lists, uh, returning functions, uh, and then basically applying those functions. So you have inter something interesting here called flat rec. This would be something like let rec, uh, where you're doing a mutually recursive. Uh, scope here for functions. Uh, there's also like let star, so you can basically have, as you have your bindings for let, the, the next binding uh, can call into the, what the previous binding was. Um, and these are really, you know, I've always really liked how Racket Scheme and Lisp have, done, have, have dealt with scoping. You have a lot more control over scoping. Uh, and this is a really good example. So with flat rec here, I have this function um, that I can then call anywhere else uh, within, that, within that scope. Erlang, oh. yeah, so I, as I go through, like these comparisons as we go back and forth, yeah. Uh, so yeah, the test pass, is, you know, and yeah, there's a great testing framework in LFE that looks a lot like uh, the closures uh, death test uh, stuff. So they, they've done their own. Uh, they had some work initially just working with EUnit, which is what people use for closure, uh, for Erlang, but uh, they've, they've written their own uh, library. It's really nice. All right, macros are kind of the really, really cool thing. I think this is the coolest thing about LFE and applying it. Um, and you know, uh, David Nolan had talked about in a talk, he gave an early talk about why list macros are so great. And we, we know these things, code generation, DSLs, DSP, um, we, you, know, it, it gives you, you, can do, you can do dry better, you can do a lot of, a lot of template stuff. Um, 
Here's just like the, the, actually the first introduction to uh, macros and Lisp was in 1963 by Timothy Hart. Uh, if you ever read the evolution of Lisp, it's really, really great, kind of a whole history thing. Uh, so I was reading this paper here, just to give examples. We, you know, so Erlang has, has preprocessor macros like you do in C. Um, uh, yeah, so where that's based on token substitution macros. Uh, but here we have, you know, in LFE, like we do in Lisp, we have real syntax macros that, uh, that operate on the uh, ASTs. Um, and I'll show you some cool examples of that now. Uh, so just a, yeah, it's, right, it's a little bit. So one of the things that, that comes with LFE, you have this idea of the, the back quote macro, um, which is itself a macro, and I'll show how we actually use it in macros. Uh, it sh it's more like the tick. I, it, for some reason, in the, in the, uh, in the Beamer uh, output here, it's the, I, it should more look more like a tick than a back quote. Though it is called a back quote. Um, so yeah, so here's a quick, uh, uh, some of your talks earlier, we ta always look at like an example like the Rust one about destructuring. So uh, destructuring is not something I always think about in Erlang very much, but with LFE, this is something that's really easy. So you see this match lambda here. Uh, match lambda comes out of uh, common lisp. Um, I'm actually, I have this list where I have the, where I'm duplicating the count item. I can actually um, match here on, on the item count. This is an anonymous function. So again, match lambda. I am matching an anonymous function to get these values. Um, so this is something you, this is something that the back quote can do because it's basically like creating like a template for variables. Okay, so I wrote a macro. One of the, like one of the macros I always really like from Clojure is the, the single threaded and the double threaded macro. Uh, use them all the time. Basically kind of do like a pipe operations so you don't have to have all the parentheses all the way go through. Um, so I was like, oh, let me write, uh, let me write that macro in uh, this favorite Erlang. So this is an example of what it does. I'll come back to the show. But so I have here, uh, I just define syntax rules. This comes out of scheme, actually, um, where I can just define the syntax rules here. Um, so uh, like on the single-threaded macro, I have, uh, I, you know, I basically bound each of these things. If I have a list of, you know, I have, I have a one element and I have this cons of various elements where the dot, dot, dot just means the, what the rest might be. Um, so you keep going through here. And actually, this is stolen. There's a, a racket example of the closure thread macros that I basically just almost stole. A couple of little different things that I had to do. But it works. It works right off the bat. So all this power, is, uh, power of macros that you have, you have at your fingertips with LFE. And that's really cool when you're thinking of it. Now you're going to deal with concurrent distributed programming in Erlang. So you see how I call it right here. I'm, I'm getting the cutter. Obviously, we're, we're taking stuff from list again, taking the cutter, which would give us two, three, four, five, and then we're just adding one to it. And you see this works. I, you know, test for it. This is a real thing. It's just that it happens. So cool things you can do. You can do this in the REPL. You can macro expand. So you have the ability to, to expand macros. So we have like a really simple one here where we're just adding elements across. When I get six, if I do the, 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 double, the, 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 the opposite way of the double uh, threaded macro, I get uh, a pair. But you see here, so yeah, you, Erlang, when it's calling the Erlang, it shows the actual arithmetic calls. But you can, you can imagine like as you're experimenting and going through things, that you're writing macros, and you can have macros that call into other macros. Um, you can get a whole expansion tree and do a lot of interesting work with this. This is something you can't normally get in Erlang, but you get in Lisp, but you have everything together. Now, uh, we show that this is a Lisp 2, so it's unhygienic. Um, this could cause issues with collisions and semantics. Um, the whole point, there's work trying to do gem simming. Um, like, uh, you know, Elixir does something called late binding, but we're tr they're trying to get gem simming in, but it's going to take some time just the way uh, as it goes through um, dealing with Erlang. Yeah. Unhygienic? Uh, so, yeah, so um, hygiene basically get, has a concept of having unique variables. So there's no, there's no ca catching a scope. So if I have a global variable and I have a macro, there's not going to be uh, an issue where that, glo that global variable is caught, is caught in scope, like is, is, is uh, replaced by the one in the macro, right? So in the list two, you have this harder, harder time with that. I have to go a little bit faster uh, <laughs> as I got a few more. But uh, at the end of the day, so the cool couple other things that are really cool about LFE is that it goes into an intermediate representation called Core Erlang. I won't go into the specifics, but like everything with Erlang, you can do so much where you can go, you can get the Core Erlang with one simple call. This is some of the expressions and variables in that. Uh, so I have a simple function here. This is what Core Erlang looks like. It gives you every line, everything like that. Um, I'll skip the parser generator part. It's also really cool how uh, right now in LFE they have a they have a hand hand done table going through each of the elements how they do the, that they do the parse from LFE to uh, Coralang. 
Uh, they're eventually rewriting it to it's actually a real parser generator. Uh, and and LL1 parsers are really interesting top-down parsers. So there's a lot of work going on in LFE. It's a really cool language. has a great testing suite. Uh, there's a guy named Duncan McGregor who's doing great work to kind of make the community really something to happen, and you should hit him up if you're interested. And uh, talk to me more. We can run a REPL and uh, write, some, write some macros. Thank you.